So, now it's my pleasure to uh, ask uh, Matt Warren from Vico to join us on the stage. Matt is, um, uh, belongs to Vico, and they're one of our digital dozen. Again, the 12 companies that have been um, uh, researched by the Welsh Government and the ICT sector panel are likely to make a big impact in uh, Wales and the UK in the digital technology space. Uh, they work in the area of uh, inventory and order management integration, so uh, integrating with the likes of uh, Amazon, e uh, eBay, Magneto, and so on. Um, they are uh, here today. Uh, Matt is here at the front, so I think without any further ado, I'll ask you to take the stage, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Matt Warren, founder of Vico. And before, um, before I tell you about the Vico journey and how I started the company two years ago, I'm uh, going to talk to you about luxury watches. Bear with me, <laughs> there is a good reason. Uh, this is a Rolex watch. Just a quick show of hands, does anyone know what Rolex watch this is? One, two, three. Okay, it's pretty good, I'm quite impressed. Uh, it's a Rolex Daytona watch. Uh, this costs about £8,000. Um, it's got a 12-month waiting list, so once you've bought this £8,000 watch, you then have the privilege of waiting 12 months to get it, uh, which is obviously fantastic for Rolex. Ten years ago, I couldn't tell the difference between a Rolex watch and a Casio watch. I had no idea about anything about watches, uh, but a good friend of mine offered me a tag watch and he said he gave me a discount. So being a geek, the first thing I did was go online, try and find out mm, how much they cost, you know, where do I buy one from, this kind of thing. And I was kind of shocked to find there was nothing out there. There's no website selling watches, there's no information. Um, so I thought this would be a really good idea to start a business selling watches online. Uh, so like most people, the first thing I did was ask my family, ask my friends, you know, what do you think about this idea? They said I was completely stupid. Nobody's going to buy expensive watches online. And uh, being a bit uh, <laughs> stupid, I decided to go for this idea anyway and uh, created a company called Dura Watches. And we launched that business back in uh, 2007 and um, we managed to persuade a bunch of really cool angel investors and the banks to give us a million pounds to create the first uh, online luxury watch store. Um, and after a sort of a shaky start, we ended up being quite successful. Uh, we were the first company in the world to sell watches online, officially. And we grew the company to have over 30 staff. Uh, we had a retail store in Burlington Gardens in Mayfair and one in Kensington. We sold through our own website, we sold through Amazon, and we even sold some of the second-hand stuff through eBay as well. And that was our website. So. My, my journey of running this e-commerce company, selling on multiple channels, taught me a lot of things. Um, and we, we had quite a few operational issues that sort of tied up a lot of our time, so we weren't actually you know, pushing the business forward. We were continually firefighting, trying to make things better. For example, um, my team would spend four hours every day just shipping out orders. You know, they'd get an order from Amazon, copy and pasting the data into the Royal Mail system, printing shipping labels, that kind of thing. Um, Another major and probably the biggest issue we had was what we call in retail as overselling. So someone would walk into our shop, they'd buy a watch, spend 5,000 pounds. 15 minutes later, someone would buy the same watch on our website. And as far as they're concerned, it was in stock still. Not cool, because then we'd have to phone that customer and say, actually, we don't have that watch anymore. Someone else just bought it before you. That customer gets annoyed and angry probably writes a bad review about us, we've got to try and appease that person, we've got to refund him his money. It's a complete disaster for a retailer, especially high value items. Uh, and generally I used to get very upset about it. This is kind of sums up how I felt about when that overselling happened. In fact, this guy's probably holding it together better than I did. So those are kind of the reasons that I wanted to start Vico. So Vico is order and inventory stock management system for retailers. It's basically becoming the back office for retailers to manage everything that they do from one dashboard. So we hook into Amazon, eBay, we hook into their website, we become their point of sale in their retail stores, 
and we bring everything down into Vico so they can see all their orders and they can manage them much easier from one place. The other key thing we do is when stock changes in one of the locations, so if someone buys something from your Amazon store, Vico will automatically then go to your eBay store and change the stock levels. It does this all in real time. We've integrated with most of the major UK carriers now. So that means our, our retailers can click one button and they can print up to 300 labels straight away. No more copy and pasting data, no more copy and pasting tracking numbers back into FedEx or anything like that. It's all done automatically. And it saves about five minutes per order on average. So we're a software as a service company and we make our money from charging our retailers a monthly fee. Starts from 30 pounds a month, um, but can go up to 500 pounds a month. And it all depends how big the retailer is. If they're doing a 100,000 orders a month, then they'll be paying 500 pounds a month. If they're doing yeah, 100, they'll be paying 30 pounds a month. It's easy in, easy out, so we'd have no contracts. You can take a free trial on our website and, and it's instantly set up for you. So Jonathan talked about um, MVPs and I think it's a really important point. When I sort of thought about Vico, I imagined the chocolate donut with the sprinkles on top. And when I spoke to more technical people, you know, that was going to take years and millions of pounds of investment. You can't just create, uh, go away, spend two million pounds and, and, and create something and then hope that actually everyone's going to buy it from you. That, that would be mad. So we, you have to start somewhere. We started with our minimum viable product, which was a plain donut. And, and our MVP was effectively the most basic version we could get out that people could actually use at all. And if I, uh, I saw some screenshots of it the other day, and I was horrified and completely embarrassing. It was horrible looking, didn't do much. Uh, and I think that's what it has to be, though, because that's the bare minimum that you need to do it. Um, and initially, I bootstrapped the business. So I, I, I funded a, one developer to create this version myself. I got two or three people to use it, one of which was Jura, my other company. And the feedback from those customers was, yeah, this is, this is quite good. It needs this, 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 and this, and this, but we like it. It's saving us time. And that sort of validated that what I was building, that maybe there's some other retailers actually would you know, pay for this. So the next step then was to raise some funding so we could hire some full-time developers you know, to build the product out, make it more usable, and sell it to more people. So we did that. We raised some money. And I'll tell you in a minute about how, how we did that. But the next step was we had these two developers. We started building features. We were very naive. I've never run a software company before at this stage, so I wasn't you know, doing things properly per se. Um, and one of the key features for me was integration of Royal Mail so that, you know, they could just print shipping labels much easier. So uh, I set the developers to work on this project. They come back and quickly tell me, oh, it'll take us six weeks to do this feature, integrate Royal Mail. Um, and it took two of them, so fine. So let's, let's definitely let's go ahead and do that. In the end, it took us five months to complete this feature and we had to hire an extra two developers. So a feature that I thought was going to cost us about £6,000 ended up costing us nearly over £35,000. And that was naivety on my part. We didn't estimate it correctly. We didn't look into it. We didn't research it. We didn't actually find out that actually Royal Mail really suck with their API and, and they have no documentation. And we also found out afterwards that, that I think only three companies have ever integrated Royal Mail. There's a really good reason why that happened. They're a pain in the ass. But we did it and we got it out. If I'd have known that information at the end, I probably wouldn't have decided to build that feature. I'd have built a whole bunch of other stuff, which would have added much more value to me. And so now we have a whole process in Vico about how we plan what features we're going to build, how we're going to build them, and how we estimate how long they're going to take. So we launched Vico in June of last year, um, after being in a beta for, for uh, quite a while. Um, and this is the growth of our cust paying, paying customers since then up until now. And you can see most of our growth actually has come in the last sort of three months. We've really started to accelerate. Um, things were a bit slow to start with, um, but then traction picked up. Probably can't tell from this graph, but October, November time is kind of like a flat bit. Um, but we, we, had a, <laughs> we had quite a bit of a disaster. Uh, we were so focused, or I was so focused on building new features, getting this, if you had this one more feature, then we'd get another 10 customers. And if we did this, then we'd get that person said they'd come on board kind of thing. And I was just ruthlessly obsessed with, let's build this feature, build this feature, build this feature. Don't worry about that technical debt or that bug or anything. Just keep going down here. And we got to the stage where we were losing more customers than we were gaining more customers. We were gaining tons, but we were losing tons. We had a really high churn rate. 
Uh, and again, that, that, that was a mistake I made, uh, and with hindsight, you know, would do things differently. But what we did is we just stopped. Like one day, I'd, I just had enough. I called everyone together in the company and said, right, for the next two months, we're not going to build one new feature. We're going to stop now, or we're going to fix every issue. We're going to you know, improve the performance and fix all the bugs. So by January, we'd done that. And Vico was a lot more stable. We'd removed nearly all the sort of uh, key and important bugs. And then our, our growth started to, to pick up again. And we then, we're now back to focusing on uh, new features. But now we're more sensible. So we spend 30% of our time on technical debt and fixing bugs. So since we've been going, we've, we've raised um, just over a million pounds in total um, from angels and uh, crowdfunding. And we've done it over multiple rounds um, for various reasons. So I'm just going to talk you through our, our experience with that and, and how we found it. So this is the first round we did back in February 2013. So this, at this stage, I'd proven with a few customers there was a bit of demand for what we were building, and I just wanted a bit more money to hire a few developers. So we raised £30,000. We raised it in 19 days from 66 investors. Um, and it, I was just really interested. Having raised money before with Jura, this crowdfunding was quite new, and I thought it was quite exciting. For me, it seemed like a, a really you know, great way to go for, for raising money. Yeah, because with angel investors, unless you know lots of them, it's hard to get in front of them, it's hard to get meetings with them, it's hard to know where they are. Uh, and the crowdfunding, I mean, Cedars, I think, have, I don't know, 50,000 investors on there, and Crowdcube has hundreds of thousands. The first round was really successful, and we had loads of investors actually come to us and say, well, actually, I wanted to invest, but you'd finished. So we decided to open, continue that round. Um, we raised another £120,000. As soon as we put it on the Cedars platform, it completed within uh, 24 hours. We gained another 22 investors uh, in that, doing that. So one of the Cedars guys was a guy called Dan McPherson. He invested, I think, about £5,000 in the first round. But he came down to see us because um, he, he thought what we were doing was really cool. And he, he came down, saw what we were doing, and said, you know, this is brilliant. I, can, I, can I, I get this. I want to invest more. And I'll introduce you to this guy I know. So I went up to his London office and he introduced me to Tom Singh. Tom Singh founded New Look. Uh, he's an alleged billionaire. And kind of like a, in terms of retail, he's you know, one of the heavyweights out there. So we had a really cool meeting with Tom Singh. And, and um, just there and then, after a 10 minute conversation, he, he asked if he could invest £100,000. And if uh, things went well, then he'd invest further in land. So it wasn't a planned round of funding. But um, when you have the option of having Tom Singh on board, then for us as a retail you know, company, it was, was a really good you know, opportunity for us. So we, we grabbed that with both hands. So late last year, we'd got to the stage where we were gaining customers. We knew how much it cost us to acquire a customer. Um, we had enough customers on board, and we, we, knew, we kind of knew all our key KPI stats uh, for the business. But what we wanted to do now was accelerate it. We wanted to go faster. How do we get, do what we're doing now, but on a, on a bigger scale, you know, so that we can take market share away from our competitors? So we decided to raise uh, what was then £250,000 to do this. Um, we put it on the Cedars platform. Um, we actually ended up raising a lot more than we planned. We raised £678,000. Um, and it, it was, it was a, a bit of a crazy sort of few months, really, because um, initially when we launched the campaign, we weren't sh you know, it started off really well, then it kind of slowed down for a week. Sort of self-doubt started creeping. Oh, my God, you know, what, what if we don't raise it? What if it doesn't come off kind of thing? Um, and then, then the week after that, it just went bonkers, and we were literally had to close the round before I had, you know, so I had actually some shares left in the company. Um, uh, um, but, you know, it was, a, it was a good experience, and now we've got enough funding to do a lot more uh, than we planned. Someone asked me actually earlier, he said, oh, well, you asked for a quarter of a million, why would you take more money? And there's probably, I think, a rule of thumb that people will tell you is, you know, never turn money down. But for us, it just means we can go even harder and faster than we planned. And it was an opportunity to not have to raise funding another 12 months to do the same thing. So I think there were a couple of reasons that we decided to do that. So yeah, in total, we raised a million pounds from, from crowdfunding and angels. Um, we also raised 50,000 pounds from the Welsh Government's Digital Development Fund. It's not that well-known fund, but it's a non-repayable grant. Uh, the criteria of it is basically you've got a match fund. So if you want 50 grand from the government, you've got to find 50 grand from investors or someone else. 
specifically aimed at tech and media companies. Um, and I think it's a, it's a great scheme. It really helped us in the first year to match fund our CEDAS funding and just meant we could get a lot further of the project than we could have w without it. So what, what have I learned from crowdfunding? I think as Jonathan said earlier, it's not easy. It's not the quick, easy win. You can't just put your company up there and watch back you know, as, as the money ticks in. Uh, it, it, is, it is like raising money from angels or anything else. It is incredibly difficult. But I do think crowdfunding gives you that platform. It gives you access to a lot more investors than in past was possible. So there might be that one investor who really buys into your idea and will invest you know, 10, 20,000 pounds into your crowdfunding campaign. And momentum is absolutely key. Um, investors are like us are like sheep. You know, when they see something's getting carried away or it's going really, really well, they just think, well, you know, what do all these guys know? I know maybe I'm missing, the, missing something here. I should jump on this. And the only way to start a crowdfunding pain really is to uh, get all your friends and family to invest some money. It doesn't matter if it's ten pounds, fifty pounds, hundred pounds. When you launch your campaign, if it if it says zero raised, zero percent, no one else is going to put money into it. So, if you can't get your friends and family to put ten, twenty quid in, then you know it's it's going to fail. So, one of the key things is to is get all that organised and lined up well in advance. Um, so, little things like preparing a press release, crowdfunding is still a fairly um, new thing, especially for mainstream press, so you know, definitely should be able to get local press about doing crowdfunding campaigns, and it all helps you know, get people to your campaign. Um, we, we, for the first campaign, I did a video uh, myself, and it was absolutely horrendous. You know, it was like 60 seconds long, me talking, screenshots of our horrible software as it was at the time, and it was terrible. For the next campaigns, though, we did, did invest in doing a decent video, and it made a massive difference um, in terms of uh, what feedback we got and how people are much more you know, interested. I think a video shows people that you're serious, that you've put the effort in, uh, and also just communicates that you are a professional person. So I think we touched on these stats earlier, but I think um, only 15% of their startups reach their crowdfunding target to show you how difficult it is to raise funding. Uh, this is the best stat. So once you reach 30% of your funding goal, there's a 90% chance that you will actually complete that. And that just shows, go back to the thing about it's all about momentum. If you can get it past that 30%, in theory, then it should be downhill from there. So uh, since we launched in June, we've um, managed to get some quite cool customers on board. Um, so Lucy's Boutique is the girl from The Only Way is Essex, who's been on TV. Um, but who knew? She sells loads of stuff uh, through her shop and online stores. Just Hype, I'm told, apparently is a very cool uh, clothing brand for young people. Uh, and Organic Surge, they do uh, like beauty products, but they get sold in Waitrose and John Lewis and stuff like that. And they use us to manage their inventory for their uh, shops and for their websites and selling on, on eBay and Amazon. We've managed to get some decent press, and I think a lot of that was off the back of crowdfunding, um, because it's something that still you know, quite interests the press in terms of that. So we've been, been fairly lucky in the press that we've got. Something that's really important, I think, that I've learned um, throughout my career is that having great advisors is really important. And getting great advisors is actually a lot easier than perhaps most people realize. So Dan McPherson is probably my mentor. Um, you know, we speak every week, we update on progress, we discuss things, he'll criticize me, he'll uh, say some nice things. Um, the key thing I found is identify your weaknesses. So my background is being a programmer, is I'm quite technical, um, I'm quite savvy like that. My weak area is probably sales, and Dan McPherson has a really strong sales background. Um, I, you know, I'm quite comfortable knowing it's not my greatest part of my sort of uh, makeup. Dan knows that, and Dan you know, helps me with that. He, he will advise me and, and sort of, uh, train me in those, those kind of areas. So I think any entrepreneur should identify their weak spots, be cool with it, and then find some great advisors to kind of help you, you know, fill those spots in. And one of the things I know that a lot of investors look for is they do want to know what the, what the weak spots for an entrepreneur is, not to, shut, you know, to have a go at them or anything, just so that they, they, if they understand the weak spots, they can help identify issues coming up with that. 
Tom Singh is uh, not massively hands-on, so I don't speak to him that often, but when I do, you know, uh, it, it is always worth listening to and very interesting for me. So since we started two years ago, we've, we've gone from just me to, you know, we now have 26 staff. Um, we're all based in Swansea, in a tech hub there. Uh, I'm really proud that we're building Vico in, in Wales and in Swansea. Uh, I think there's a lot of cool technology companies being built in Wales right now. And um, I think we need to show the rest of the world that Wales can do it as well as anyone else. Because to create great tech companies, what you need is great talent. Um, and, and we've got plenty of that. We've got some fantastic universities. And uh, we've hired probably six or seven graduates from Swansea University and Swansea uh, University Met. Um, and it's been a great experience for us. Our CTO has trained them up. And they're now really sort of important key members for us. So since we launched, we now have hundreds of paying customers. Um, I think it's really cool that we have, a lot of our customers are not in the UK. They're in South Africa, Australia, America. They're all over the place. And that's the really cool thing about building a tech product is that it can be used anywhere in the world. You know, it's not something that's just going to be used locally. Um, having these customers all around, around the world means we're, we're in a global marketplace. Our current growth is about 25% month on month. Um, now that's uh, obviously quite good, but also brings lots of challenges and, and makes things quite stressful sometimes. Uh, recently, we were uh, picked by uh, Pitch 10 to pitch Vico at number 10 Downing Street in front of some really cool VCs and Google and Facebook, uh, which you know, I think you know, was a really great experience for me personally. So we now we've got some money. Um, we're doing OK. The next sort of plan for us is the next few months we're going to be launching in the US. We're going to open an office uh, and hire a few staff there. Um, majority of our customers are so 80% are based in, in the UK. So we now want to expand into America. Vico works perfectly fine in the States. We're adding a few features specifically for the US, um, such as USPS support and stuff like that. That's going to be really exciting la launching in the US. And, and uh, you know, we're hoping that that will really sort of increase our growth. One of the big features we're working on is called Vico Shipping. So at the moment, we just integrate with carriers so people can print labels, which is cool. Um, but we're, we're negotiating with various carriers so that because of the volume of shipments that Vico produces for hundreds of retailers, that they should give us better, cheaper rates, and that we can then pass on these cheaper rates to our retailers. But at the same time, Vico can make a small margin as well out of this. And you know, potentially what we're looking at is even making Vico a free tool completely, and that we'll just make our revenue from uh, shipment rates. Our sort of vision and dream for Vico is to build a big global company. In a few years' time, I really want Vico to be worth 100 million pounds, and you know that we have a fantastic team in Wales doing that. And I think we're on the sort of the beginning journey of that now. And uh, I, I, yeah, hopefully, in a few years' time, uh, you know, we'll be at a stage where we've got a few thousand customers uh, and uh, you know doing really well. I hope. Uh, and that's kind of uh, my VCO journey, really. Um, I, I, a lot of people ask me about crowdfunding and stuff like that. If anyone does want to speak to me afterwards, I'll be hanging around. And um, I'm more than happy to sort of share my experience of, of crowdfunding. And, and, and uh, if I can help anyone, I'm more than happy to do that. But yeah, thank you for your time today.